change lives, change lives, change, 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 change organizations, change organizations, change the world. So I'm a, a Prajit Mahajan. I'm an assistant professor in the economics department. Thank you all for coming for, uh, I think, what has been the end of a very productive day. Um, so what we're going to do now is uh, talk more generally about issues around business, uh, on business and entrepreneurship in post-conflict economies. So perhaps appropriate since we're in a business school. Uh, what I'm going to do is briefly introduce uh, each of our panelists, who will then maybe spend about 10 minutes each uh, talking about how they view the, the rather abstract question that they were given, um, and then we'll open the floor up to questions. Uh, so let me introduce our panelists. I'll do very, very short introductions. Uh, we have Neil O'Casey, who is the manager of, of ManoCap. Uh, we have George Foster, who is a professor of management at the Stanford uh, Business School and who's also, who's also the chairman of the Global Agenda Council uh, on Entrepreneurship at the World Economic Forum. Uh, we have Gail Lemon, uh, who is a fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations and has written extensively on entrepreneurship and conflict, starting from her time at the HPS in 2005, and has also actually written a book on entrepreneurship under the Taliban. And then we have David Welch, who is actually the president of uh, the European, African, and the Middle Eastern divisions of uh, Bechtel International, and is also a former U.S. Assistant Secretary for Near Eastern Affairs. Um, so, the topic for this forum was uh, generally thinking about the hurdles and opportunities for business and entrepreneurship in post-conflict or post-transition economies. And uh, what I'd like to do is maybe have each of our panelists spend about 10 minutes um, sort of talking about that, maybe with reference to a particular part of the world or a particular set of issues that they think are relevant. And maybe we could start with uh, Professor Foster. Thanks very much. Um, I'll just make some general comments in terms of uh, public policy, pri uh, private sector initiatives, and what seems to be working in certain areas. Um, in terms of the uh, general comments, I think when you look at this area, one of the dangers is to sort of always view Silicon Valley as the light at the top of the hill. And I see endless caravans of politicians coming through trying to search for, can I do Silicon Valley Glen or Silicon Valley Moscow? And I think that's sort of uh, pretty misplaced for a whole lot of reasons. Um, one of the biggest challenges, this is a very tech sector part of the world, and a lot of the areas for opportunities for entrepreneurship in other sectors are not necessarily going to be require 2,000 software engineers. I think they're going to come in even some traditional sectors, whether they're textile, agriculture, those type areas. And I think the more you can sort of think about entrepreneurship a little bit more generically rather than a startup in a garage and hiring three engineers, you're probably better off and further down the line to achieving something. Um, as regards to the role of government policy uh, in emerging countries, I think one of the biggest challenges is that I think there's a little bit of electoral fraud on this going on at the moment in terms of governments where they're viewing, uh, if we put 10 million or 10 billion into entrepreneurship, this is going to solve the unemployment problem. And uh, the Global Agenda Council, which I chair, we sort of were just debating this issue quite a lot and we saw fit to issue some statement in terms of what's realistic and unrealistic expectations out of this sector. And if you think a company is going to take three to five years to sort of get up to even 200 to 500 type people, it takes a hell of a lot of those companies to think that you're going to solve a problem with unemployment of 20% unemployment in a youth sector. So I think basing realistic expectations is a very important aspect of government policy because there'll be a whiplash when they don't uh, see the unemployment coming down quickly and there'll be backlash against entrepreneurial initiatives. So I'm, I'm very concerned about that area. Um, I do think there's uh, very strong areas where the government can play. Um, I think one of them in terms of say like the telecommunications sector, what we've seen is uh, deregulating the telecommunications sector that takes away the established companies like in cable and wireless in the West Indies. Digicel sets up has just been a wonderful story in terms of empowering a whole lot of young people to sort of use mobile phones for commerce. And I, I see those are the sort of things that governments, if they're doing policy initiatives, they're really proactive initiatives. Um, obviously, 
doing corruption, uh, addressing corruption issues are very important in terms of when you speak to the challenges facing entrepreneurs. Um, one of the big problems is what I call the hardware software problem. There's a, a real emphasis on government policies to building things rather than putting building minds. Uh, we looked at the challenges facing entrepreneurs in Asia, uh, all five con continents, and the very common finding across all the all cases we looked at were people-related issues with a major challenge. And I think the more that you look at that, you sort of look at some of the misplaced initiatives where a government will do a national broadband network. I just did a, a report for Australian government, and uh, they're doing a $40 billion plus broadband initiative in Australia, and we were supposed to recommend some issues in terms of uh, what I call the software aspects, the people aspects, and our proposal was 50 million, and they said that's far too expensive. And I said, well, wait a second, you're doing 40 billion on hardware, and the hardware won't work without the software, and it's, it's really misplaced in terms of underest investing in people. The last comment I'll make in terms of this is what is working. Um, there's no question that spawning an entrepreneur set, very early entrepreneurs who then give back and build up the circuit where you have those entrepreneurs be mentors to the next generation is, is very effective. Um, I'm working with Endeavor uh, on this, which is in Latin America, Middle East, uh, going into uh, also Indonesia last week. Um, what, the, what they're finding is that really the power of the mentorship and the role models in those societies is, is very, very important. So I'll, in the interest of time, I'll leave it at that. Well, first of all, thank you. It's really delightful to be here. But I think sometimes you get so close to your work that you don't get the opportunity to hear people that you are reading or people that you are. I think, in fact, that Neil and I were supposed to meet in Sierra Leone, although I don't even think he knows about it at a dinner. So it's wonderful to actually <laughs> meet here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about entrepreneurship in places where people really don't expect it, which is conflict and, and particularly post-conflict and during conflict uh, regions, and maybe just look at where we are, what the challenges are, and where the opportunities are looking forward. I think where we are is that the entrepreneurs tend to be far ahead of the international community. You know, the entrepreneurs tend to be getting on with it, by and large, and then folks from, and, I, and I'll poke a little fun at the World Bank only because I was there recently and we had a really interesting discussion about whether the entrepreneurs we were talking about were simply exceptions or were people who were worthy of investment. And I think that this is a real challenge because what you see on the ground is people who found that when very little else is left to them, business is a lifeline. And this is both men and women, because oftentimes, when we're talking about entrepreneurship, we immediately think about guys in Silicon Valley, right? And the challenge with this is, you know, you would meet in places like Liberia, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, Bosnia, Afghanistan, where I've spent the most time, entrepreneurs on the ground who were running small and medium enterprises who absolutely no one was paying attention to. And particularly when it came to women, because everybody automatically filed women under microfinance. And so women who were tending to run SMEs were being as small and medium enterprises, were being completely overlooked, or rather, as in, in several offices I've been in, dismissed as aberrations. And so um, I wrote this book recently that was a true story about a girl who was supposed to be a teacher. And when the Taliban came, ended up becoming an entrepreneur who ran a dressmaking business that families all around, about 100 families around her neighborhood, survived upon during those years because they managed to build this workshop that created a network of markets, local shopkeepers. And that really got me hooked because there are, for every one story like that, there are probably, I don't know, several thousand you haven't heard in each one of these countries. Um, I had gone to Rwanda to do a Financial Times international entrepreneurship story, and a gentleman from one of the multilaterals said, we don't actually have any women in business here. And within you know, a couple of days, I met one woman who was exporting fruits and vegetables to Brussels twice a week, uh, another woman who was uh, exporting roses to the Amsterdam flower market, and a third who was, um, actually had women whose husbands had perpetrated the genocide and women whose husbands had been killed in the genocide, weaving baskets next to one another for sales at Macy's department store in New York. 
So I think it just shows you that people have simply, if they're being ignored, they actually don't care because they are used to so many obstacles before them, whether it is insecurity, instability, lack of prosperity, improper institutions, and live conflict. So they just tend to get on with it. Um, in terms of the challenges, I think regardless of where you are, they tend to be the same. And they tend to be the same regardless of men and women. I think they're just exacerbated for women because they tend to be farther from more formal networks, which is access to markets, access to finance, and access to networks and skills building. And I think the real challenge facing the, um, both the private sector, but often in these very fragile states, when the first folks to go in there are either the development community or the international aid community, is that they tend to look, if they look at the private sector at all, it is in very siloed ways. And business is not siloed, right? I mean, you really do have to take a holistic approach. You have to have the skills to start a company. First, you have to have the idea, but then you have the skills to actually grow it. Then you need the talent that you actually have to go out and find. Then you need the capital to actually get off the ground, whether it's very tiny bits of friends and family money or larger. And then you need access to markets, because without customers, you are nowhere. And oftentimes, what you see is the incentives are so perverse that the international community tends to go in and be able to say, we've run 12 trainings for X hundred people in 17 provinces and go fundraise on that. And at the end of the day, nobody has said, and do they have jobs? And do they have customers? And is their life better? And I think that is what has been such an amazing thing from a storytelling perspective about the entrepreneurs, is that they tend to take pieces of what is going on around them from the international community and fragile states in particular, and use it to their advantage in terms of business um, skills. I did a piece recently for Harvard Business Review uh, to the last point about where the opportunities are. I think there's huge potential in terms of both um, investing in some of these companies, and secondly, in terms of financial innovation. I mean, I, uh, we're at DSB, I went to, to HBS. Um, if you think about all the financial innovation talent there is in this world, and how little of it has actually been devoted to getting capital to the places where it is most scarce, it is in part because there's very little financial incentive to do so. But I think more and more you see things changing. Um, Oxfam, for example, is now setting up a fund. I mean, if you put Oxfam and investment fund, right, in a sentence 10 years ago, people would probably have thrown you out of the room. But right now, Oxfam is actually working with an asset manager to go out and raise money for banks and who are doing small business lending because they've come to realize that entrepreneurship is part of the solution to poverty alleviation um, and that they have to support it and want to be part of the game. And the second thing is loan guarantee programs, which I think you do see a little bit more now, but still, I think, shockingly less than you would expect given the opportunity. And I think the third thing is um, there are some kinds of, for people who are less in the mainstream, especially focused financial products. So I was in Afghanistan talking to a young guy who was working for First Microfinance Bank, which was getting into small and medium lending. And he was trying to create a female-focused financial product because oftentimes women are the farthest from collateral, right? They don't have land in their names. So he was trying to get around that issue. Even if they have customers, very few people do cash flow lending, so they were trying to convince people to do that. And longer repayment periods um, and less of a requirement for business history because many women uh, were actually not um, having a record of previous businesses. They were doing startups. And you can imagine risk capital is hard to get in this country for small and medium entrepreneurs. You can imagine in places like Afghanistan or Sierra Leone or Liberia, it's even more challenging regardless of who you are. So this idea was created, and then uh, actually, unfortunately, he was caught in a UN guest house shooting uh, and ended up leaving the country. But the idea went forward on a much slower pace after that. And I think that those kinds of innovations, loan guarantees, um, special funds, and specially focused financial products really do present an opportunity going forward. That's a good segue to what I'd like to talk about. But before I start, may I just ask a question of the audience? How many people here are students or alumni of GSB? 
Oh, good. Because <laughs> um, we're having a conference inaugural, one of a global crossroads, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the crossroads of what we've been listening to today and the crossroads of doing business. Um, I, I work for Bechtel, um, which would like to go to some of these countries in transition and make money there, uh, and in the process build things that are healthy for those societies. Uh, we've worked in a lot of countries in transition, and uh, we are working in countries in transition. Just to give you an example of some, um, in the Balkans, um, we built a road in Croatia with a loan guarantee from OPEC. I think uh, Ms. Limon is absolutely right. That's a powerful financial instrument. The road would not have been built without it, by the way. Um, we worked in Albania, Kosovo now. We're building a road there. Angola, Libya, Egypt. Uh, and in Iraq from 2003 to 2006. So this, our company has a, a pretty good basis of experience in some of these places. There's another thing about Bechtel that's a bit different than uh, some firms, and perhaps a bit more similar to some firms that start out in the Silicon Valley. We are a privately held company. So as we look at this uncertain world around us, um, you know, we're making decisions essentially with the firm's balance sheet, not a, a publicly traded balance sheet and not a government's balance sheet. Um, that's pretty critical in how you make decisions. So what I'd like to contribute this afternoon is just a few words on how you measure risk and how, how you measure opportunity, which I hope will be of interest, especially when you look at these countries in transition. Because if you notice from that menu of places that I mentioned, you know, you might not automatically say that there's opportunity in Croatia in 1999 uh, or in Albania uh, or uh, in, uh, in, in Libya today. Um, so, I mean, there are generally things you, you might look at. Uh, what, what do these places need? Um, and, you know, you have some guideposts to that. You know, what's their infrastructure development? What, what is the size of their economy? Um, do they need a port, a railroad, uh, an airport? Um, and, and you can find units of measurement that would help you discriminate among places. I mean, if you take Sub-Saharan Africa as an example, that's 42 countries. So you need some way, especially if you can't be in all 42 to check them out, you know, what, what draws your eye to them? Um, another thing is, uh, uh, do they have the money to pay for it? Um, I mean, that's a pretty important thing, and uh, entrepreneurship has its rewards, but generally you defer them for a time, and then you realize them if you succeed. Um, but as I said earlier, we're taking risks with our balance sheet, no one else's, and so uh, having the means to pay for it is really, really critically important. Um, you know, I, I think this is a, a quality perhaps that is becoming more globalized too, but I, I like to see it in American firms especially. Um, you know, what are the ethical indicators in these, in these societies? You know, basically, we, we run a healthy business. Everything we build is basically good for societies. We don't sell things that kill people or hurt people. Um, but we also are working with governments that, yes, are in transition, and in some cases might be difficult governments. We've had projects in countries that are you know, distinctly corrupt ones. But we have to do our business in an ethical way. And that's a, so how you measure that, it's a, it's a bit of a vague standard in some sense, but it's increasingly criminalized if you go against it in the United States and other places. What are the people like there? Um, what are the demographics of the labor force? Uh, are they young, old? Um, what's their education system like? Uh, can they learn crafts? Um, in Iraq, for any one Bechtel person, there are at least four Iraqis working for us. You know, how trainable are they? Um, do they have a good work, work ethic? Uh, also, political indicators are hugely important. We, we, we do industrial projects. They have a sort of two to five year delivery period and in perhaps even longer gestation period. So some political factors are very important in helping us decide, do I even want this job? If, 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 they, if they need something uh, and they can pay for it, there's still the question, do I really want to do this? And let me mention a couple of those because they relate to countries in transition. Security risk is a really important one to us. Uh, we're, we're as, as I said, a, 
a family firm in, in every sense. One of the reasons that we had difficulty and eventually left Iraq is we lost, I think, maybe 23 people in Basra alone. Now, they weren't um, American Bechtel folks like me. They were Iraqis working for subcontractors. But that's, you know, our name is on that project in some way, and, and so that risk is, is important. Now, for, for those of you who are interested in running businesses one day, Riley Bechtel has an important standard by which to measure that, which is very personal but really understandable. He says that if our corporate security tell him he can't go to a place, then he's not sending David Walsh there or anybody else working for Bechtel there. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, political participation. And I, I think that rule of law, transparency, some of the other issues discussed today, those, those are, are also qualitative factors that go into judging, would I want this job? Or take the inverse. Let's say that you know that the society is like undernourished when it comes to transparency and rule of law. You, are there ways that you can put uh, milestones or firewalls around your business to ensure you don't do anything wrong or you don't cause something to be done wrong? That's a pretty hard thing to do in some places, but it, you, know, if, if you need to find the right balance or if you're going to undertake the project, because some of these projects do have real benefits for these countries. For example, to do one in Equatorial Guinea is challenging when it comes to uh, some of the corruption issues involved. Um, there's another thing that I think is, is, is important, particularly today. Um, let's take the Middle East, for example. There is a trend uh, that wherever there's a plebiscite, uh, a vote, um, since 1991 in the Arab Muslim Middle East, uh, there is at least a plurality been returned for what might be called Islamist political parties. Now, I want to take the politics and social indicators out of this for a second. I'll leave it to you whether you like that result or you don't like that result. But let's just look at what it raises uh, as a question, and that is policy uncertainty. Because unfortunately, there is not, there's no track record of governance for Islamist governments in the Middle East. Really, there just haven't been that many. And so you don't have a, an objective way of judging their performance in government. So if you had asked me to be on this panel a year ago, and we were watching the so-called Arab Spring unfold, I might have said to you uh, what Alan Greenspan once said about the stock market, don't be irrationally exuberant as you look at what's happening. But today, you know, a year and some months later, I'd say, well, don't be unreasonably pessimistic either. Uh, it, 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 if you just look at Egypt, for example, one of the presidential candidates from an Islamist party who was disqualified is, an, is, as far as I can tell, an outright capitalist. After all, he's a multimillionaire. And, and at least 50% of those running from the Islamist parties are people who have business backgrounds. So I don't, I don't exactly know what they're going to do in authority when they get it, but my guess is they'll have to face some of these economic challenges and, and in their own lives, so they've got some experience in how they might address them. I, um, I think another thing that I want to I point out, because Trevor Manuel last night mentioned it, when it comes to policy uncertainty, let's, there's another thing to, to notice about the Arab Middle East, especially because public finance is, if, if it's strained in Europe, believe me, folks, it's strained in these countries of transition big time. So they have to make decisions about their money. Last night, Trevor Manuel said, uh, if I think I've got it right, he's, at, at one point he said Nelson Mandela asked his cabinet, uh, uh, you know, why, why are we spending more on debt service than on education? Well, it's a very important question. Today in Egypt, um, the butane subsidy, which is essentially a transfer payment, but it's given to everybody, costs more than the entire higher education budget. And if you take subsidies generally in Egypt, they are a bigger value than health care and education. So the new government's going to come in after the elections which start in just a few days. By the end of June, you'll have a transition in Egypt. And that new government is going to have to decide, where am I going to put the public's money? 
Uh, and if you make a trade-off, like you're saying, I'll reduce subsidies, well, there's a big social cost to reducing subsidies and a political price. So it'd be very interesting to watch how, how they go about doing that. Uh, the Egyptian economy is in dire straits, so I guess this decision is going to be more urgent than not. Final point I want to make is despite all those uncertainties, there are opportunities. Even in the places that, you know, if you look at them, you wonder just how they're going to dig themselves out of this mess. Um, let me use Egypt as an example, again, a country I know pretty well. Uh, the demographic bulge, 600,000 people coming into the labor force every year in a country that is probably 90 million today, is actually an economic advantage if converted in the right way. Because we're dealing with demographic deficits in a lot of higher income countries. So there is a bit of labor arbitrage to be had here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think the reason I'm here to talk to you today is uh, because I've been uh, set up and managed uh, a fund management business that invests in Sierra Leone and Liberia using a private equity venture capital structure to invest in uh, small medium enterprises uh, and startup companies as well. Uh, it's what we call doing the hardest things in the hardest places when our shareholders ask us. Um, and I'm just going to talk a bit about, I guess, my own experience of uh, setting up a business in West Africa and working with entrepreneurs who, who, who are setting up their own businesses or who are looking for finance. Um, so uh, why Sierra Leone? Why private equity? Uh, I'll talk a little bit first about Sierra Leone. Um, I mean, Sierra Leone is obviously in the West, West African coast. It's wedged in there between Liberia and, and Guinea. Um, you probably know about Sierra Leone for, as a function of blood diamonds or child soldiers, which is just a reputation the country, unfortunately, hasn't been able to get away from 10 years after the war. Um, that's, that's bad for the country, but for people like me who are prepared to scratch below the surface a bit, it's a great opportunity. Um, it's a great opportunity uh, on a number of levels, and, and I'll talk a bit about why I think kind of the, the private equity structure is the right one. Um, there's two reasons for that. I think the first is basically the opportunity which you, which you touched on. Um, when I first went to Sierra Leone in 2005, uh, Sierra Leone was at the bottom of the Human Development Index, and it shouldn't be. It should be somewhere at least in the third quartile or, or somewhere in the middle. Uh, and the reason for that is it's got lots of stuff. Uh, it's rich in natural resources. It's got all the good stuff. It's got diamonds, gold, iron ore, and now oil as well. It's the wettest country in, in Africa. Uh, I think 70% of the arable land is uncultivated. Uh, it's got fisheries resources. Uh, it's got tourism resources. In addition to that, it's got the young and, and growing population, English speaking. Um, and political stability is, uh, over the last 10 years, there's been two elections, all free and fair. And the most recent election, 2007, you had a transition from two democratically elected governments. Uh, so, and then when you look at the outlook for the long term, um, I mean, the causes of the war, the underlying causes were not ethnic or they, weren't, or they weren't religious. So the ability to move on from that. So again, like three very good factors uh, for kind of long term growth in Sierra Leone. And you know, we wanted to be part of that growth coming from the bottom up to somewhere in the middle. Um, the second part of, the, of, of kind of why private equity is the need, uh, and you touched on it earlier, I think it's the need for, for capital and skills. Um, when I first went to Sierra Leone in 2005, nobody was working with the private sector. Um, you know, I think 60% of the government budget came from, from, um, from, from donors. I myself, I was working in Sierra Leone at the time as, uh, for an aid organization and became actually quite cynical about the work that aid, aid organizations were doing. They just weren't having the impact. And again, I think that's because of the incentives uh, for the beneficiary and for the benefactor, I think. Uh, at the same time, having been there for a year, uh, I guess became acquainted with a group of entrepreneurs uh, who had like, built up these great businesses, destroyed during the war, built them up again, destroyed. These guys were like you know, resilient, really, really good entrepreneurs, couldn't get like, very, very hard to get access to, to skills, and most importantly, capital. Now, the places where they're supposed to go for capital are local commercial banks who are just too busy buying government treasury bills, getting 30% on that. Um, and then the other people who should be investing are the development finance institutions who, you know, the IFCs or the European Investment Bank who are basically too busy and comfortable from what I can see in Nairobi or in Tunis to actually look at deals in Sierra Leone, which is quite frustrating. 
you put all those things together, there's a great opportunity for a fun business for somebody who wants to work with entrepreneurs. And in addition to that, have a, like a huge impact on the economy and on society in Sierra Leone. So that, that's kind of the idea of our idea of our, where the idea started to do, to do a fund uh, in Sierra Leone back in 2006. Um, in terms of kind of, uh, I guess, what we did, um, we, we wanted to put ourselves between the, or, yeah, between the entrepreneurs and the people who had actually money and a mandate to invest in Sierra Leone. Um, and uh, basically came up with the idea that a private equity structure was the best way to do this. Um, and we decided to raise 20 million uh, to invest in, in six businesses. Um, the idea was to invest between one and five million in individual companies. Um, and we decided that we would be a generalist fund. So we weren't going to be sector specific. We were going to invest across a range of sectors. Uh, the reason for that is, I mean, despite the fact that the country has enormous uh, opportunities and, and a great pool of entrepreneurs, the pool of entrepreneurs is really shallow. Uh, and you have to go across different sectors in a small country to get that exposure and to get that uh, deal pipeline. So, I mean, and the other benefit of that is you can actually then start to get kind of synergies across the portfolio companies. Um, so that was basically 2007, moving on kind of five years to where we are today. Uh, we raised 25 million um, through a combination of institutional investors. So. Uh, the British Government Development Bank, it's called CDC, and the Soros Economic Development Foundation. And the other half of the money was raised through um, private investors, which are kind of hedge fund managers and private equity investors in the UK. Uh, we've invested in four deals since then, which is a lot less than I would have thought. Uh, we're across mobile banking, uh, commercial fishing, uh, light manufacturing, and transport and distribution. Um, in addition to that, we've built up um, a local investment team um, comprised of Sierra Leoneans, Liberians, Ivorians, um, who have a really strong kind of rationale to, to be there for the long term. And that's been really important to us. So kind of where we've gotten to is, I think, a business that's ready to go on and, and, and raise its next fund. Um, we've started the process of fundraising. Uh, we're trying to raise 100 million for, um, for Sierra Leone, Liberia, and other neighboring countries in the region that fit the frontier or post-conflict, of which, sadly, there are many. Um, and uh, yeah, we've, we've, we've started fundraising. We've got commitments for half of our new fund uh, from a combination of existing investors and through OPIC uh, have come in, which is very courageous of them. So we're, we're in the process of raising the, 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 uh, the remaining money. Um, in terms of kind of my own reflections on uh, entrepreneurship in, uh, in places like Sierra Leone, I've kind of, my main takeaway is that you know, it's not magic. It's a lot harder because there's no playbook. Um, the risks are real, but the opportunities are enormous. I see them, they're there. Um, but you know, if you can navigate those risks, like the returns are there. Um, there's three kind of specific takeaways I have for people who are starting businesses. The first is around fundraising. If you're trying to raise money for uh, businesses in places like Sierra Leone, uh, the people you're going to go to are the uh, angel investors or more typically what are called impact investors. Um, and when you go to them with your business plan, they're going to tell you they don't believe your commercials and they're going to want to see you present a very, very strong social impact case. Now, Personally, I think as an entrepreneur, once you make the decision to do you know, uh, startups in Sierra Leone, that's all the challenge that you need. So you should focus on commercials from there on in. However, you have to do this. Like, you have to be able to measure your, so your social impact. Now, it sounds really easy, but having seen a lot of businesses that, that do this, there's very few that actually hit that criteria. And the people that can, uh, that can get that message out there about commercial and social returns, the returns are really high. I think we've been successful in doing that by getting that message across. Uh, so that's one on the fundraising. The second one, I think you have to be hands-on. You can't do this from, from London or you can't do it from New York. Um, and there are two benefits, I think, two main benefits from being uh, on the ground. The first is just building up that local network. You need the credibility uh, of people to trust you. You need to be around. You need to have your skin in the game so people will believe you. Um, and that will open up deal flow and information. Um, and then externally, um, I think there's people out there with money to invest in places like this. Um, and they, they want to know that you're the, the guy on the ground, the, the Africa guy, as it were. 
Um, and they put an enormous premium on you, know, you coming out with good information saying, I'm going to do this, and it's really exciting. They, they get excited about thinking that they've got that premium on that information. So you sit in the middle between those two people. Uh, I think there's an enormous kind of return to that for being on the ground again. I won't even start about the need to be on the ground for operational reasons, totally different discussion. Um, and then the third thing, the third really important part, I think, that, that kind of differentiates doing it kind of, let's say, here versus Sierra Leone is uh, you should get uh, a group of advisors or investors that are world class, or world leaders in their own industry. Um, and there's two reasons for that. The first is, you know, crisis is a constant state of being if you're managing businesses in these places. It always happens. It happens together. It rarely goes away. And you know when you lose, like when you're losing other people's credibility, having your own like advisors that can back you up and say it's okay, the guys are going through like hard times, but we back them, they're going to come through it, it's going to be good. Having that there is really, really, really important. Um, and the second thing about having having that group is um, perspective. Um, you know the the flip side of being hands on and being on the ground all the time is that you run the risk of kind of, of, uh, of, of getting too much into the deals um, and you kind of start becoming, you can, can become part of the problem rather than kind of part of the solution. Uh, standards change, you know, so having somebody that knows your business, that's available, that's informed about what you do, that can pull you back and say, this is what we said we do at the start, you know, you, you, you're changing those standards. So there are three takeaways that I have for, uh, for anybody starting businesses in places like that. Thank you very much. Uh, we now have about uh, 15 minutes for questions. All of our panelists. Um, I have a ton of questions, so I can certainly start, but I'm happy to keep in the audience for the first time. Could you just go in more detail as to how you measure social impact in a way that's meaningful to your investors? Sure, very good question. Um, and um, right now at the moment, um, we are actually, we are, because we're raising a new fund, um, we are in the process of, of kind of putting out the metrics that we've done obviously financially on the commercial side and on the social side. Um, and I think we, we articulated that message very, very well up front. It was very high level, it wasn't specific. Um, and I think one of the things that, um, that we, we haven't done extremely well is, is, is measure it. Um, the things that we do do are uh, we measure, uh, obviously, to the, to the kind of the standard metrics of like to environmental impact, social impact, and governance. Um, and there are the three things that we prioritize. We use IFC standards, and they're very, very well prescribed about, about how you do it. But using those standards, it's very, very hard to get across the, the real story about what we do. You know, people like, to, like our shareholders, um, our investors like to see jobs created, number of women employed, those kind of things, which, you know, the, we, we have those things. But the thing that I find really hard to articulate about startups and businesses like ours is, um, you know, the impact you have at a wider level on kind of creating new sectors, access to markets, financial sector deepening. Um, and you know, if there's anybody here that's, that's more skilled in this than me, I'd really like to talk to them because that's been a real challenge for us, and I think it's, it's also a challenge. It's easy to articulate it at the start, what you're going to do, but to measure the impact of it. So you know, we're at a stage in our fund now where you know, we're halfway through the, the first fund in terms of its lifetime. The financial returns, I mean, aren't spectacular. We didn't expect them to be, so we have to make a really strong case of the social side, and that's been quite difficult. Um, and we're trying to work with our, our investors. You know, they are kind of they are social investors. They help us with that kind of thing, but um, it's really difficult. I don't have the I don't have the right answer for it in terms of how you do that. But um, the kind of as I said, standard metrics are measuring through environmental impact, social standards, which is kind of job creation, and then governance. You know how the board functions. Some of the metrics uh, you could also do is how how you're globalizing the company in terms of say the number of overseas partners that are coming in wanting to do business with you, a uh, number of distributors wanting to take your product. Uh, if you think that there's a sort of a branding aspect to not just the company but to the country, can you do that? Uh, I was talking to a lady who was doing rose manufacturing in Kenya and um, Ethiopia, and I think she's now the third largest rose manufacturer in the world. 
and um, she saw the major advantages that way and she was doing metrics. And just to get to your point in terms of the challenges uh, in the Kenya situation, I know there were riots and she was basically having to hire private security people to get the roses uh, from the ground to the planes at night uh, so that they weren't attacked during the day. So, I mean, you think that there's some dark moments that you go through in Silicon Valley, there's some pretty black moments in some of these other parts of the world in that area. Yeah, if I find, um, we teach a case um, around entrepreneurship in Afghanistan at Harvard Business School. And uh, we got this question about, well, what do you think about social enterprise? And, you know, I think it's really interesting, but I tend to think that when you see these businesses on the ground, every enterprise that is functioning in a place like Afghanistan has an enormous social benefit, whether it is employing some of the young people, two thirds of Afghanistan is under 25, whether it is creating some kinds of employment opportunities, because what you see happen is the minute that people who are employed have income in, they tend to send both daughters and sons to school. And the multiplier effect of the education that the children is getting is actually one of the best anti-poverty fighters that you can invest in anywhere in the world. But I think that that is sometimes a struggle because in places with power and water and light and things that function, there is often a divide between the social benefit and the economic benefit in the way people think about it and the narrative about around business. Just as a follow up on that, one of the uh, members of the Global Council I'm on, um, he has a business, at, I mean, Peleg out of Israel, and, and he's trying to measure water usage. So he maintains that approximately 30% to 40% of the world's pipes are defective. And so, sure, there's a water problems, but some of it's self-inflicted in terms of you've just got very badly repaired pipes in a lot of, uh, not just in, um, in developed countries, but especially in underdeveloped countries. And so he's trying to develop a business to have very good technology to detect where the, say, the leakage is in the pipes and the breakdowns of the pipes. And that's got an enormous social benefit in terms of much more efficient use of a scarce resource as well as a financial benefit. Hi, I'm uh, Daryl Slack, uh, MBA 97. Uh, my question is for David, but I think you all could probably speak to this. Um, but David, you raised the topic. How does a company, how does anyone uh, operate with an ethical framework, with ethical business practices um, in, in, a, in, in companies that have prevailing corruption? And can you just say a little bit more about that? Uh, hmm. Well, there are some instances where you have kind of a, uh, a natural firewall. Um, we're in a public forum, so uh, I mean, this is publicly available information, but I want to be careful and diplomatic in how I speak about it. Angola. Um, if you look at any in index of uh, transparency, uh, uh, rule of law, nepotism, and corruption, Angola doesn't feature really highly. Uh, we're nonetheless able to, or about to complete the largest industrial project in their history. But one of the reasons we can do that is our client is a consortium which includes international oil companies and the state-owned oil company. And, you know, th they're all very attentive to how that is managed, and of course we are as well. So in a way that one, that's a bit of an out to your question. There are other places you know, where we just won't, we won't do it um, because we know that that's a problem and we can see it flat out coming at us. And, and uh, you know, even though the, it's a strategic market of some importance and interest and, and we, we sense that there would be an opportunity there and perhaps even a specific one, you know, there are a lot of red flags that go up and we'll just say, hey, you know, too hard to do. Um, now, Maybe other firms wouldn't make that decision. And, and as, as you probably know, there's some American companies, unfortunately, been prosecuted for having made incorrect decisions in that respect. I guess the, the question is a, a little bit harder, you know, when you start to get to the outer concentric circles of how some of these things function. I mean, the question earlier was about sustainability and social impact. Well, of course, a lot of these economies are trying to recirculate the, the, the pounds, the dollars uh, in, into their own system. 
And there are lots of informal ways of doing that. And you know, you, if you're in the construction business, you have to buy rock to build a road. You, I guess you gotta be looking very carefully at who owns the quarry. Uh, it, there's a cost to that. Let me be clear about another thing too, for all of you who wanna do business globally, uh, there's a lot of competition that pays absolutely no attention to that, especially in some of the transition or high-risk areas. And that's really unfortunate because the social cost in those societies ends up being enormously high. Uh, and I think you have, they have to go through a sort of maturation period in how they deal with it. And we may be seeing that in some parts of Africa now where there's a diversification impulse on the part of some countries because uh, our Chinese competition has been there on the ground for some time and they don't like the results. Uh, they don't like the results from the Chinese, that is. I, Angola, again, is an example. When I visited Angola the first time, I was stunned. You have Chinese laborers laying bricks in that town, in Rwanda. Uh, and there's, there's, I think, very high youth unemployment. I mean, somebody else could lay the bricks. Um, so I have a question, actually, um, while we wait for the audience. Uh, I was struck, actually, both uh, in this conversation by the role that measurement seems to play in, uh, measurement of outcomes seems to play in, in this conversation. So Gail talked about that with respect to what she thought, you know, uh, state organizations were doing in terms of how they measured success for loan dispersals. And, and Neil talked about it uh, in terms of measuring social impact to convince investors to invest in his fund. Um, and I was wondering if they thought that there was a role here for uh, for academia to sort of uh, provide some of this impact now? It's sort of a self-interested question, but uh, you know, in part, I think uh, there's a movement within academia to sort of uh, be interested in these kinds of impact evaluations, and uh, the GSB set up this big institute for, uh, for entrepreneurship. And I'm wondering if you think it's actually practical to imagine uh, academics providing that sort of, uh, the, the impact evaluations themselves, and if you think the incentives are aligned sort of on all fronts for something like that to happen. So it's a question really for Gail and, and, and Neil, but anyone anyway, can take it. Yeah, um, absolutely huge. Again, um, like it's so complex and it's like the, 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 you're measuring something that's moving a lot over time and I don't have the resources within my own business to do it for sure. And I don't think, you know, it's still such a new thing. Like people really don't know how to quantify it. And I think, so it's evolving quickly. Um, and there is a I think there's, there's a huge role for smart people who've got resources to actually be dedicated. I don't have the answer into exactly what the right thing, or how, you, how you do that, but things like the SEED initiative are, are really, really positive in that regard. And I think there's, you know, it, it, the, the impact will be being able to tell the story, I think, of people like my business better and being able to unlock more finance for, for, for you know, places where it's really hard to get it into at the moment. Well, I think that there is, a role for in a couple of ways. I think first of all, defining what it means, right? When you talk to about impact investing or social returns, there is no generally understood answer as to what you're actually talking about, um, which I think creates a lot of confusion and I think unnecessarily creates a great deal of skepticism from traditional private equity VC uh, players who otherwise I think would actually be potentially interested in this. I also think that coming out of business schools like GSB, uh, I know from my own that um, there is a great deal of interest among students and among younger people who want to you know, both do good and do well, right? Who are really interested in the positive power of business to change the world. Because if you look at what business is doing now, it is having a dramatic effect in transforming people's daily lives in ways that I actually would argue most governments uh, are not. Um, in the micro, at the most micro level. I just finished a story, um, which should come out in the next uh, two months or so, for Fast Company about Afghan tech startups. Right? These are kids who are like, who puts Afghanistan and tech startups together, right? But there are these kids who are really going around every obstacle, including corruption, including any number of obstacles, to because it is business that they see as the transformative um, lever in their lives. So I think academia could have a role in defining what we're talking about. And I think also in really, uh, I'll say this uh, because all of you have too, in really uncovering the ins perverse incentives that have for so long determined what money goes where when we're talking about either fragile states or some of the toughest economies of the world. 
because I truly think that most of the incentives are on the sides of wealthy countries and wealthy organizations delivering the money and very little in terms of actually looking at longer term measurement about what the actual impact is in terms of changing people's lives, alleviating poverty, all of those things that you're talking about when you're talking about particularly economic development. David, you go first. Um, uh, I, um, I've never been an academic, so uh, I, I don't really know I mean, there's an, if there's an automatic answer to what academics can add to the evaluation of opportunity and risk and how to measure it. But it's clear that some of the standard tools, let's say you hire out for due diligence on a client or an organization, you know, may not, may not be sufficient. So um, I, we, we try a, an approach internally because we, so much depends on the quality of our decision making where we, we bring in outside advice that might be actually quixotic under the circumstances. And you just sort of, you sort of ask them, okay, this is what we're using to measure here. What do you think? Um, and we've done that recently with academics. Actually, it was quite productive um, because our own metrics had said, okay, if you look at all these countries, gee, they have in common the following three negative characteristics, bad transparency, bad rule of law, uh, and, and bad corruption. So we needed another way to look at, okay, if, if every single one of them is that way, is there a different way of looking at, uh, at them? And, and it turned out there was. I, I think um, one of the things, the, the difference between, say, business and academe in sort of analyzing data is sort of merging and blurring. And I think if you sort of looked at Google, I mean, the, the quality of some of the people they're hiring to sort of do experiments and analyzing data, they would be just as comfortable, and they are from academics, some of them, but, but you could run incredibly good, intellectually strong workshops in an organization like that and, and have just as stimulating a debate. I think w where you need some really strong metrics to come through is where a lot of money has been put into, say, accelerators and inhibitors. And these are words that are thrown out all the time, but not all accelerators are good in terms of wise user resources. And, so what you'd like to know is what are the distinctive characteristics of an accelerator that works well in this environment and if we're going to hire mentors uh, or associate mentors with these, what's the most effective way of mentorship? Is it one to many, one to one? And the more you can sort of do structured analysis to get some insights in that, you probably can increase the hit ratio from say one to 10 to three to 10, which, which would be pretty good in, given what I see out there in terms of some accelerators. So we have time probably for a couple more questions. Hello, uh, my name is Kalisha. I'm a senior at GW in DC. Um, and my question is kind of as a piggyback off the lunch session about technology. How has technology changed um, entrepreneurship in new economies? And as more people have access to the resources on the internet, and also maybe from a um, company standpoint, how can that help you to connect with, um, you know, previously untouched people or people that weren't previously accessible? Yeah, I mean, there has been a dramatic decrease in the cost of setting up companies, just dramatic. And there's been a dramatic cost in getting feedback from the marketplace on a lot of areas. And I think those combinations have really made it easier to start thinking about a fund that maybe not five million, but you could do 50 ventures in a fund of five million. You've done four ventures, which is really private equity, which mm -hmm. is, was the thrust. But I think the technology area is just transforming the ease at which you sort of can start the thing, and but more importantly, scale it and sort of get traction. I think Afghanistan in 2001 had about point, less than 1% uh, phone penetration. Now you have 60 to 80% cell phone pen network penetration, and more than 50% of households have access to at least one mobile phone. Um, most young people in the cities, right? as I was saying, you know, most of the country is under 25, um, will have at least one SIM card, if not two, because there are four active cell phone networks there. And a lot of them drop calls, so they will just swap SIMs out, um, depending on what's working. And I think when you see what 
you know, the challenges are enormous because the power and the infrastructure and the roads are simply not there. But one of the best things I think that the Afghan government international community did was to put almost no regulation in that telecom area at the very beginning and you've seen increased innovation and young people who are really using it to think about where their businesses are going to go and where their economic opportunities uh, are going to come from and connecting to the outside world in a way that a decade ago was really shockingly foreign right to be able to use Skype and 250,000 Afghan kids on Facebook which is, you know, it's not an insignificant number if you think about the literacy rate in that country. I mean, uh, I think one of the most profound impacts is through mobile banking, um, and we're seeing it in Sierra Leone, one of the businesses that we started. And I mean, it's not a direct impact, but it's like f mobile kind of phones facilitating transformation of people's access to financial services. So, you know, you can, you can, but completely bypass the physical branch network and set up your business out of your village. It's amazing. Um, and, and people can set up kind of trading, uh, trading relationships with people in other villages. It, it's, you know, in Sierra Leone, we have about 80,000 customers. Um, and in, in the last 12 months, phenomenal adoption and ability to bypass like, the banking sector, bring down the cost of access to financial services for people, really having a big, big impact. Um, I'd, I'd make three quick points. First, uh, the, the ability to use technology uh, is, is readily transferred into profit. Uh, I mean, it's just, it gives you new ways to measure efficiency, which means you make more money on the job. Uh, second, and we're, since we're an engineering and construction firm, and we, we have most of our business, more than 50% outside the United States, um, the ability to use some of these tools means we can operate on a 24-hour time zone. So to build a project maybe in the Middle East, we might use an engineering execution unit in New Delhi, but they can hand off to engineers in Frederick, Maryland, uh, you know, during the day, um, and that, again, increases efficiency. Third, it's also introduced a risk. And I'm sure everybody in this room knows uh, the risk of privacy. Well, for, for firms, just like for individuals and for governments, uh, that's probably something we didn't have to the degree we have it uh, today, 10 years ago. Uh, so with these uh, benefits does come that uh, potential uh, cost. Uh, and that can actually literally be costly to protect yourself against it. It's also hard to get people to change their way of using technology, so it's more careful. Change lives. Change lives. Change, 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 change organizations. Change organizations. Change organizations. Change the world.